Hello. Welcome to today's WCET webcast, part two in our The Mechanics of Competency-Based Education webinar. Today, we are going to talk about mentoring for student success with CBE courses. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET, and I am the lone floating head that's not on video after experiencing what they called the, the bomb cyclone here in Denver. We've had some technical difficulties, so I'm gonna stay off video, but our, pres our presenters are on video. As we move through today, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. We will be monitoring that, and if we need to interject, we will. Otherwise, we'll hold your questions until we get to the Q&A portion after the presentations. I've posted a link to the slides right here in the chat, so you can download those slides. The webcast is being recorded, and we will send you the link to the recording and any resources that are shared next week. We also tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box. We'll be keeping an eye on that. You can also post via Twitter. We have a wonderful moderator today, good friend of mine and WCET's, Callie Morrison, who's the Associate Dean of Alternative Learning at American Public University System. So I'll let Callie go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Callie. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for having me here today, guys. I am excited to hear um, and work with our team here today on this second part of our webcast series on the mechanics of competency-based education. As Megan said, I'm Callie Morrison, and you see my title there. Um, that kind of means that I have CBE, PLA, and new credentialing methodologies under my uh, tool belt that I work on. So I'm excited today to welcome our two um, esteemed colleagues from WGU. We have Chuck Hostler and Verna Lowe. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and then in their introduction, um, model what I'm going to do next. Say one thing that you're looking forward to. Typically, mine would be skiing those Montana slopes after we've gotten all this nice, uh, nice powder from all of these storms. But I'm looking forward to my MRI on Monday to figure out what it is I just might need skiing on those white slopes last Monday. Uh, Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Callie. Uh, it's good to be back with everyone. My name is Chuck Hostler. I'm the uh, manager for compliance and accreditation at the College of Health Professions at Western Governors University. I've been in higher, uh, higher education for the last 20 years and about 13 of those years as associate dean for College of Health Professions. Uh, the thing that I'm looking forward to is I was lucky enough to score two tickets to see Elton John tomorrow in Jacksonville, so I get the privilege and honor of taking my wife to see her idol. Verna? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Verna Lowe, and I'm the Senior Manager of Compliance and Accreditation at Western Governors University. And I have been in uh, higher ed, particularly more educator preparation higher ed, for about 37 years and have served as Dean of Ed for um, more than 20 years in my prior life. And uh, if what I am looking forward to, I am looking forward after a very busy spring at Western Governors uh, to a very lovely beach vacation in the summer. <laughs> Both of those sound excellent. I would love to uh, combine them right and make like the uber competency of relaxation by seeing Elton John on a beach. <laughs> that would be perfect. That would be. <laughs> so I'll let you guys take it away from here. Well welcome back to those who attended part one and for those who did not welcome to you as well. Um, before we begin talking today about mentoring uh, for a competency based education we thought we'd do a quick review. So it's a very short uh, YouTube video that many of you may have already seen that kind of covers the, the um, broad outline of competency-based education. So as soon as Callie gets it pulled up there, here we go.
I'm not sure the audio is not coming through. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Well, in the interim, I'll hop in and say that the video that we're about to see was created by the Competency-Based Education Network as part of our um, collaborative group effort to inform the greater population in the U.S. about what competency-based education is in general and how it might be a benefit to students in the long run. So, um, hopefully we'll get that up and, and running, but if not, in America today, more people than ever need higher education. Yet far too many don't pursue or earn degrees, often because traditional classroom-based programs don't fit their lives. In response, a growing number of colleges and universities are offering another option, competency-based education. Each program is unique, offering creative, state-of-the-art learning opportunities to fit the needs of many students who might not otherwise pursue education. Programs accomplish this by transparently communicating the learning objectives students must achieve to earn degrees and other credentials, by enabling students with existing knowledge and skills to personalize their educations and accelerate progress towards completion by using technology that enables students to learn anytime, anywhere, at prices they can afford. And by integrating support from faculty, mentors, and coaches that can build confidence needed for success, aimed at creating fair and just educational results. While no single option is right for all students, these programs offer relevant and verifiable skills for greater success in work and life. The Competency-Based Education Network is helping colleges and universities create programs that engage students who otherwise might not be reached. Learn what's happening and what's possible at cbenetwork.org. Thank you, Callie. Hope everybody enjoyed that short little YouTube video. Um, I think it does a great job, and it really focuses in on a couple of things that we want to talk about today. To start out, I wanted to, to, to just mention that when we thought about CBE, one of the things we always think about as we're developing a course is what will be the barriers to those for students. And of course, then we make sure that we build robust support systems around barriers to remove those barriers and allow students to move through the curriculum. Most of what we've done, I'm sure most of you have in your own universities, we have a robust writing and math tutoring system, financial aid advising that um, number of scholarships, just about any kind of financial aid students could want. Uh, CB does not disqualify them from federal or, or usually even state grants. We of course have a large library resource with librarians that actually on where we have campuses sitting in dining rooms and, and, and facilities waiting on students. Um, and then of course online we have online specialists who deal with students uh, in, within the colleges they're in. We have a robust student success center that creates a lot of YouTube videos and webinars, work with students on a lot of things, from time management, stress management, um, how to write a resume, how to, how to use Word, um, how to actually use Excel, those types of things. We have large learning communities that um, consist of students of their specialties um, that faculty are involved in as well when, when asked. Um, some of those are live um, or synchronous, not live but synchronous, and some of them, most of them, or some of them are asynchronous. And of course, IT services and we offer online counseling, but the one that, that we think of most when we think about removing barriers to CB education is the faculty, the mentors, and the role that they play um, in ensuring student success. In fact, we think it's the most important thing. If you could go to the next slide, Kelly, I apologize for that. Power off my phone so that doesn't happen again. Um, again, as I said, 
here at WGU, we, we think of student success, the faculty model is the most important thing. The faculty role model, uh, they take care of the students, they interact with them in a lot of different ways that ensure the students are engaged, have the tools that are necessary to be successful, have someone to cheer them on, be there with them, and um, someone who is the content expert that really knows the course material um, the subject that the students are in so that they can always be there to support them. Verna, do you have anything to add to that? that? <clears throat> uh, not at this time, Chuck. I'll let you okay. keep going. <laughs> our model here at WGU for our faculty, we, we, we basically have five kinds of faculty. And we think of um, our student that's been in the center of all of those faculty. So here's an, an um, example from our teacher's college. We're a teacher candidate, it's of course the core. And around them are what we call the program mentors, who are those folk who um, just you know, contact the students every week. And we'll talk more about these roles throughout this pr presentation. The course instructors, evaluators, and then curriculum faculty, and assessment faculty here at WGU, we definitely consider anyone who's writing assessments and who is working with the curriculum to be part of the faculty because they are. If you go to the next slide, please. A simpler model, perhaps, is what's <laughs> is coming up next. There we are. Kind of uh, shows the division between really um, those assessment curriculum faculty who are really non-student facing faculty and then the student facing faculty and how those interactions occur. Around the student, the student facing faculty are the course instructors and the program mentors. The course instructors here at WGU are instrumental as the content um, experts. They know this material or this subject matter inside out. The program mentors have a very broad job. They have to know the curriculum inside and out so that they can instruct or talk to the students every week and help them through any problems they have with the mechanics of the course and what may be as expected out of an assessment. Evaluators, although not really student facing, sort of interact with the students because they do uh, grade the assessments and that goes back to the students. The students are able to see what the evaluators had to say about their, uh, their assessment, the work that they did on it, and the proof that they demonstrated competency or not, if they mastered it. The two faculty members that really are not student facing are the assessment faculty. And these are, we have uh, specially trained folks who are very adept and skilled at psychometrically creating assessments that are proven to um, distinguish between the knowledge we want students to master and knowledge that's just kind of good to know so that we know that we're getting to the core of mastery. And then the curriculum faculty who work with them all to help write the program and each and every course. Next slide, please. So, Verna, I think this is where you oh, were going to I chime think in. It is. Thank you, Chuck. Um, one of the things that, as Chuck was going over the model, is we're really illustrating that in a CBE world, one of the most important pieces are faculty, and they are not necessarily, the faculty model is not necessarily like a traditional faculty model, based upon all the different kinds of supports that a student has to have in going through a CBE program. Uh, as Chuck had referred to, these are the invisible kinds of faculty, faculty that the student doesn't directly see or experience, except maybe the evaluation faculty through their own feedback that they may receive. Uh, when we look at this division of labor across five different types of faculty, it really allows for two things. It allows for individuals who have expertise in these areas to really um, use their expertise and to be very focused in that area. But it also allows candidates or students to receive the very best type of and level of expertise in their program. For curriculum faculty, 
a lot goes into the design of a curriculum or even into the design of a course. In a traditional faculty model, a lot of that is done by a, a faculty member or a particular department. Last week, I spent all week in Phoenix related to the design of, of new curriculum. And it was very interesting to watch all the different players that came there. There were curriculum faculty, assessment faculty, evaluation faculty, there were some mentors and course instructors. And then there were some uh, individuals representing national expertise. And so all of them played a role in the development of this curriculum. This was not the first of that type of meeting. There will be multiple meetings that will occur over time to develop that curriculum. And then the assessment faculty are looking at the competencies that fall out for that particular program and they're designing assessment measures that are authentic and industry driven so that we can be assured that candidates can perform those competencies out in their world of work. And then the evaluation faculty ask a great deal of questions of what uh, we want to see, uh, what level of performance we want to see related to those competencies because they are the ones that is the stamp of approval that those competencies have been met. And so right here, when you get this PowerPoint, you'll see that this is uh, what I've explained to you is a piece of what does occur. And one of the things that I would share after coming out of traditional higher ed for so many decades is I'm, um, I can see a real benefit to this type of faculty model uh, related to how much it supports candidates because every entity is always about what is going to be best for students and to get them to perform at the best of the job that they are planning to do. And we can go to the next slide. Now, the people who are the visible support are the program mentors and the course instructors. And they have some very unique positions. Uh, one of the things I'll start off with are the program mentors because probably when I came to Western Governors and, and entered this system, this is the uh, one group of individuals that I was most intrigued by. And program mentors are people who are guides by the side for the student. So as soon as they are admitted, they are assigned a program mentor who is going to go through their journey with them through graduation and even sometimes beyond and helping them with jobs and different pieces like that. Also, they can help them if they want to re-enter and pursue additional degrees and additional certifications. Program mentors are well prepared as Chuck has said to be coaches, counselors, and also they have to know the curriculum. Many of them have had experiences out in the field in those particular areas. And one of the things that I like about program mentors is this is a constant contact with the student. So unlike when students have advisors in higher ed who may meet with them periodically, program mentors meet with them systematically and consistently across the whole experience and typically weekly. Course instructors are individuals who are, uh, have degrees and credentials in the particular areas in which they are teaching. They, uh, although curriculum folks have designed the curriculum, and this, these will all be standardized courses, course instructors are looking at different ways to present the information or to help students who may be struggling to learn it. So they may come up with some different ideas or use different tools to assist the students in their learning journey. Course instructors also will respond to students um, very consistently and provide that support as they're going through the different courses. And students get the opportunity to really know their course instructors within a program. And so to give an illustration, I think this is one of those joyous movie clips where you get to see a program mentor, a mentor and a student uh, meet. And this student is so appreciative of her program mentor. <laughs> okay. Good to go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for having me today. 
Life doesn't stop just because you're going to school, and you're bound to get lost along the way. Whenever I did feel lost in a course, I again used my personal compass, who by now had a name and a face, my mentor, Jeremy Little. But I knew my mentor, Jeremy, would get on the phone and say, hey, this is where you should be going. I found myself reassured as I progressed through the degree. I would always tell you where to be when <laughs> I can't tell you how proud we are of you. Thank you. You're definitely a role model. Oh my gosh. We know how much you love traveling. Yes. We know how many places you're going to go. <laughs> yes. So we got you something to <laughs> share with you. What is it? Oh, man. Oh my gosh. I love this. Can you read it? Follow your inner compass, but carry this one just in case. <laughs> <laughs> we know you Thank love to you. travel. Thank you. Oh my gosh. What will stay with me after spending the last year and a half, two years with Jeremy is probably how he had so much confidence in what I knew. And uh, he, he didn't have any doubt. And even if he did, I didn't sense it. And the fact that someone that I've just recently met can have that sort of confidence in me from just hearing me speak and seeing how I work, it, that's, that's gonna definitely push me because that means other people can see in me what I see in myself. Well, I can't speak enough how impressed I am of you because you weren't sitting at home, you were always traveling, you were always doing so many things and it really did impress me. I think you really took control, you took ownership and you made it happen and that's why you're here. Yeah. The compass can look different for everyone. It can be in the face of your child, the smile of a spouse, whatever your compass is, it all guided us to Western Governors University along our path to our true north and beyond. Congratulations, graduates, we did it. One of the uh, pieces here that you may notice is particularly with competency-based education because it's already a personalized curriculum because there are sections of it that you know and sections that a candidate or a student may not know. And so they gauge their time by what they know and don't know. Along with that personalization of a curriculum comes the personalization to help them grow into uh, the individual they want to become and the individual to be able to serve out in their own communities. Can we go to the next one? Now, I would have to admit, I'm probably a little partial to this one because it is about education. However, I would say that, again, it's about how a person has become confident during their schooling process because of that personalized attention that guided them throughout the journey. So let's look at this particular one. Great teachers were. So that's what I always wanted to do. What do you guys think is going to be the measurement for our bottom? Kona? Yes. My dad, he wanted my brother and I to have a good, solid education. He transferred to, you know, the States. In Puerto Rico, we say the states, and we didn't know any English. So every Saturday for six months, we had private tutoring. My parents would take us to the library to make sure that we were getting books in English, um, so we would be able to make those connections and and learn faster. But financially, I didn't have the means to um, go to college. So after I got my AA in education secondary, I got a job as a substitute because I was there almost every day. They offered me the job as a teacher assistant, instructional assistant. They, they kept encouraging me. It's like, Lisa, you need to go back to school. You need to go back. And I finally um, decided, you know what? I, I, I need to do something. Um, whether it's with student loans or scholarships, I need to do something. And I started to research online 
um, colleges that I could actually do and not have to stop working. And that was my biggest thing. I needed to work and I found it. And um, it was Western Governors, the first one that came up. I was like, wow, this is what I'm really looking for. So let's review a little bit. Trapezoid area formula. The English is not my first language. That was a little bit of a challenge for me. Sometimes I wanted an instructor in front of me, but that's where the course mentors came in. I was very blessed in my years at WGU um, to have very supportive mentors. She was there whenever I needed that support, um, whenever I didn't understand something. You know, I would email her right away. You can also work at your own pace. If I finish the class, then I could start the next one. That was great because, you know, if you're done, you might as well just keep going. Thank you guys. I will see you on Monday. Good job today. As teachers, we are continuously learning. And I feel that having a good, solid um, education to continue that and resources for that is very important. With WGU, I felt I, I had that. The education is good. The information you get is good. The flexibility is amazing. You always have that support phone call away. It prepared me for where I am today. And when I, I got that diploma in the mail, oh, it, was, it was the best feeling ever. And to get a job, I was hired before I actually got my diploma in the mail. I am a sixth grade math teacher at Edgewood Middle School. As an employer, I'm grateful. The reality of what school is all about, learning all the time, lifelong learning. She's not only living it, she's promoting it. And day by day, you can see that evolution happening. As an online learner herself, will she be able to inspire other students to learn in unique ways beyond the classroom? For sure. And see if you can give me the area of triangle MPN. But you just got to remember, they're giving you the measurement from here to here. When I'm in the classroom, I'm thinking kids. I'm thinking, hey, this kid may not be comfortable with math, may hate math. And I, I actually had the first day of school, I tell them, everybody will be telling me I hate math. Gets it out of their system, they feel more comfortable, and that's my goal. I don't want kids to feel like math is this huge monster. Teacher of the Year is something that Hartford County Public Schools does um, to um, sort of reward and recognize those the hard work that Hartford County Public School teachers put into their job. And um, I was chosen for my school. I, I felt very appreciated, and my kids, even students that I've never taught, they will pass the hall by me in the hallway and be like, oh, Ms. Bermudez, you know, we're so proud of you. And it, it means a lot. Recently, Lisa Marie was the a finalist for Harvard County's Teacher of the Year. Uh, one of the things that made her an outstanding candidate for me was her own personal story. She decided, I think I can really change kids' lives. Uh, and she decided I'm going to go get certified as a teacher. Through the challenges, I think she recognizes that there was so much to learn but so much potential in every single kid. The letters that I got from the kids um, telling me how much they, they hated math, and by June they came out loving math, that means a lot to me. And for my parents, knowing that their goal of coming to the United States, for my brother and I to get a solid education was coming true, it was an immense joy for them. That's a good feeling. As you could tell uh, from her story, both program mentors who are the guide by the side and the course instructors uh, were individuals that uh, were very visible to her and very supportive of her. And particularly, uh, sometimes they need support right at that particular time, a moment in time. And that type of personalization uh, is one of the pieces that goes along with uh, competency-based education. That level of on-time support. Chuck, do you have other things to say? Well, I'd just like to add that I think the videos are very um, telling that faculty, even in an online CBE, are very instrumental to students. And even though they may not see them in person, they certainly visualize them throughout their time there. Um, one of the first questions I usually, or one of the comments I will commonly hear when I'm doing site visits is, oh, you teach in competency-based education, so you don't really have faculty. And that's just a miscommunication of the faculty role. 
within um, community within competency based education. So I like that the videos very clearly demonstrate from students' perspectives that yes, the faculty are there. They're very active as, as well as hands-on faculty in the classroom, and they're very important to the support of the student. Without that, they wouldn't get through. And so, Verna, are you taking this last slide? Well, back to that slide. <laughs> well, I think if you want to start, I'll just pick up at the end. <laughs> one, having said all this about the faculty and that the faculty are one of the linchpins and the, and the foundation, really, of a competency-based education in our view, uh, one of the most important things to think about and sometimes a challenging thing to do is to support the faculty so that they feel refreshed, engaged, energized, and they feel like a part of something broader than just um, an online course or a CBE course, as some people tend to think of them. Um, one of the things that we, we do here is upon hiring, uh, we make sure that the faculty are engaged in at least 200 hours of professional development. We feel like it's very, very important that you, t that you bring the faculty in, uh, that you meet with them, and that you offer them um, training in CBE while the faculty have never taught in a competency-based education program. Um, and so we immerse them in the competency-based model. It's very important, and a lot of that occurs during that, in that um, initial 200 hours of professional development. We also hold some professional trainings. We actually uh, bring in all of the faculty from the college twice a year. Now, we don't just bring them in for a cheerleading session or for meetings. We, we actually have um, peer-reviewed sponsored presentations that are part of these um, that allow the, the faculty to get CEUs to further their own professional standing. Um, some of them are, indeed faculty training, some of them are just WGU um, meetings to go over standards and changes and policies. But we also, as I said, we, we, we offer professional peer-reviewed um, sessions and they can earn CEUs. Um, we also hold, an, an, uh, during those college summits, we might have some policy decisions that we make, like if we wanna talk about our mission and, and so forth, that's a good time to do it when you've got everybody there and present. So they all feel, everyone feels like they're part of building uh, the structure that they work in. It's very important. We also hold an annual all hands meeting, which is an interesting one for me, the all hands meeting. We bring in all the faculty from all the colleges and all the support folk, and all, all the administration. So we're all there together. We all get to talk about what's going on at the university and we get to, um, to socialize a lot as well as to discuss moving forward, what, what we're gonna do as a university moving forward with our uh, colleges and everything. And then um, we also do a lot of specialization for placements and clinical skills. We have a special um, department that we created that does all of that for the faculty. You know, in a traditional model, the faculty are expected to do it all. Teach the class, write the test, give the test, grade the test, do the assessments, contact um, institutions, get contracts. We have a department that's, that really specializes out for that. They, they get our clinical agreement affiliations with all the institutions they do, the students or faculty bring to them. Make sure that those affiliation agreements are in place, are current, are renewed when they need to be. Um, and that, that they can supply our students with clinical skill settings that they need to be in. They can give them that experiential um, experience, that experiential education that's so vital and important to their uh, success. And if we have don't have everything in one facility, we can work then, they will work then to make sure that they get a second facility to cover that. And that just relieves some of the stress from the faculty of having to go out and do all that negotiations as well. Uh, we have our own outreach teams and an onboarding specialists that will bring in the faculty. The onboarding specialists are highly trained in um, the orientation process. They know for each college, they're specialized out to the colleges, so they know exactly what we need um, them to do to support new faculty as they bring them, as we bring them in. Um, and they hold those every month, I believe it is, Verna? Yes, they do. Yeah, 
Um, and then um, I'll let Verna talk more about the the best practices in the professional development. Um, Teachers College has done a lot more of that than the College of Health Professionals, to be quite honest with you. Uh, in Teachers College, they uh, do a number of things uh, every two weeks. They actually create uh, different types of videos and they actually will uh, take course instructors and program mentors through different kinds of tools, different kinds of techniques that they have discovered that works. And uh, they keep a record of that. They have a whole listing of uh, just a whole library full of videos of best practices. It's been very interesting to watch because many of the program managers are ones who are encouraging both program mentors and course instructors to share their uh, best practices. And so it has been um, wonderful to watch how they can advance instructing their students and how to make it even more personalized from uh, not just introducing a tool in a particular course, but also uh, coming up with a way to have a variety of contacts with students. One program mentor created a whole system of how to uh, stage all the different types of contacts that you would do with your student and found out that that variety really worked and it kept the students with a very high level of engagement which WGU tracks uh, actually daily. And so uh, having come from higher ed, uh, I don't know, I think Chuck and I might have given a whole lot. I've had such intensive and personalized professional development. So what they, what we do for students is also the same thing we provide for our faculty. You know, and Verna, I'd like to, to add just one more thought there. Um, my apologies for thinking. Oh. But <laughs> one of the other things is that really is important, I think, um, as we look at faculty workload, when you're supporting faculty in a, in a competency-based education model, at least in one like ours, traditional faculty workload doesn't, just won't flow. You could never have enough faculty. And there are no seat times, so you really can't do it that way. And so one of the things that we do is, is to gauge faculty, student success, we monitor each faculty success with the students. And not in a punitive way, and not in a way of, of punishments or, or holding them back, but in a way of saying, okay, maybe we have too many students per program mentor now because we're starting to see a little distress among the students. Mm -hmm. So then we add program mentors. We don't diminish the program mentor and say, oh, you're doing a bad job. So I think it's very important to, to realize that in order to, to get to the best faculty workload, you have to understand that that um, student success can guide that, but only if you're looking at the metrics that are necessary to assist your program faculty um, so that they can help the students to be successful. And sometimes that just means adjusting the numbers that you have. I would also add in closing, I know this looks like a very expensive model. Actually, it's a very economical model. Uh, you have a lot of faculty in um, in different programs and there are many faculty that want to do different things there'll be some faculty that would just love to teach and that's all they have to do and there'll be other faculty that want to do other things so it's actually looking at your faculty and trying to find out what they really uh, enjoy doing and what's their level of expertise rather than just thinking that you have to add on more faculty yes yes good point thank you very much <laughs> Yeah, so then it becomes about a, about matching skill sets, right? Yes. Absolutely. Rather, yeah. So someone who's, who's uh, better suited will do a more efficient job and do it with a smile on their face rather than grumbling through the parts that, that they don't really care for. Exactly. So we have some questions from the audience. Are you guys ready to, to start? working through some of those? We are. Sure. <laughs> all right. So the first one, and they all kind of relate to, you know, to um, this faculty structure. The first one asks, how does WGU structure compensation for the different types of instructors? 
Kelly, I don't Are know if I heard the whole question. Okay. okay, so, sorry. Oops, sorry, the question was asking, um, how do you structure at WGU, how do you structure compensation for the different types of, it says instructors, but faculty, right? So the faculty right. mentor, mm -hmm. all, all the way down. Yeah. I, okay. I can only answer for the College of Health Professions. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not um, privy to the information from the other four colleges. But for us, um, there really isn't any difference between the program mentors, the course instructors, and the evaluators. They're all, um, or any of the faculty, they're all um, high professionals. They all hold a minimum of master's degree. Most of our faculty in any role hold a PhD or a DNP or some doctoral degree in another related field. Um, so our salaries are pretty much set and, and um, there's not a huge variance in, in the uh, mean or the median. So across our faculty, it's, it's fairly set to be the same. That's also true over in our college. And, and it's based upon that they all have uh, specialized expertise um, and we're just splitting those roles apart, but they are still paid uh, similar in a similar way. So that leads into the next question, which really I think has answered itself already, but I just wanna, you guys to give me the thumbs up that you feel like we've answered that. Um, so another attendee asked, are there grading faculty, the grading faculty, are they paid by the item or paid or viewed? the grade recorded or hourly salaried? It sounds to me like <laughs> all three faculty types are salaried. <laughs> they they uh, are salaried. They are. <laughs> Sorry. With, with the exception, of course, of the part-time adjunct faculty mm -hmm. who are right. salaried, but in a different way, in a different way. And then um, for any clinical faculty that's a part-time, then they can be hourly if they so choose. Uh, yes, we hire clinical faculty too which would be like a sixth type of faculty. But we also, uh, related to evaluation faculty, we also hire part-time evaluators from the field. We have learned that if we hire other teachers to evaluate uh, teacher performance uh, in, on some of their tasks, we actually get a truer evaluation and they give us great feedback yeah. on this will meet the expectation out in the schools and this will not meet the expectation. And uh, we've been using that as a guide. That's great. Uh, the next question relates to the professional development that you have for faculty. Um, this attendee asks, is the professional development paid since it's required? Are there accountability measures for what's expected to be learned in the best practice development opportunities um, and they say eg we taught times technique oh x technique not time sorry <laughs> we taught x technique you must use it the number of times in each month or with each student i can so really that goes just, down to yeah <laughs> i will tell you that they are required to meet weekly in in some kind of session and then they will have these bi-weekly additional type sessions and then they may come to our then they come to our uh, twice a year e large events in which they would have continued professional development there as chuck indicated that may result in ceus or may help with some of their uh, own licensure pieces and then we also have national speakers and so it is a kind of a variety and it's tracked um, over in teachers college it is tracked all uh, each person's professional development and what they're engaging in is tracked and then it becomes part of their evaluation record and the same is true over in the college of health professions we we uh, we do track all of that and of course if they go to uh, if we send them out to professional developments in a seminar or to present, then we, we always supply funding for that. We're very fortunate we're able to do that. So they are allowed to attend conferences, particularly if it's on, around some need. Another one, just as an illustration, 
uh, we have a number of states that require uh, what we call recency credit, where your instructors have to go out and be in the schools annually for X amount of time. And so that is something else that's tracked related to their own professional development, and they have to write in uh, that kind of information, and that's also considered in their evaluation. So when you're talking about, um, I'm gonna pull this question back around again. A couple of slides back, you talked about there being these, um, the national trainings and all of that. Mm -hmm. Is that primarily for your full-time faculty? Or is that, is that everyone, everyone? And do you compensate um, part-time faculty since this would be above and beyond their um, instructional load? Chuck, you want to take a swing of that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say that we, we, we require full-time faculty yeah. to attend. Uh, part-time faculty may attend, it's yeah. up to them. But full-time faculty are required, um, so they're reimbursed for all their expenses. In fact, uh, for us, it, we typically go ahead and, and reserve the room, take care of everything, um, the expenses ahead of time. So there's no out-of-pocket as well, because you, you're going to have to pay it anyway. You might as well do it up front. We just went to Orlando um, just recently, the Teachers College did, and they make all the arrangements. They make all the arrangements for your room, uh, actually for your food, um, and they made arrangements for your travel. Basically, everything that you need is all done for you, and you just get the information and then come to the meeting. <laughs> and, and I will say but, that the response from our part-time faculty has been robust. Yes because they do like being able to travel and they do enjoy the CEUs and, and uh, getting the credit for this. So hasn't been a problem so far. In fact, it's, uh, they enjoy it. That's also professional development teachers can use if they're part-time in their district. It can apply back to their district. That's great. I think that, you know, um, I think the requirement of full-time faculty and, and inclusion of part-time faculty is uh, is very forward thinking in preparing those faculty and also in showing care for your faculty, right? Because it's, as an institution, you show care for those faculty regardless of their um, their status as full or part-time, then that turns into them sharing care for your students. That's right. So it's creating a different a different type of culture around how you how you operate. Mm -hmm. it, it certainly helps with the turnover as well. I mean, it does diminish that. <laughs> it does. It does. Let's see, I'm trying to look and see. I don't think we have any more questions in the Q&A. Let's see in the box. Um, yep, Lisa noted that she said it, she helped, she could imagine that it helps prevent burnout. That faculty <laughs> can migrate and get a 360 degree awareness of each role and not get burned out on one role for too long. Do you have faculty who who move from between roles? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's a very good, that's a very good point because it does you know it, it allows faculty once they've gained their expertise in one portion, say say the course instructor, and, and they do that for a while and then think. I'd like to do this part, I'd really become the expert at writing an assessment. And then they have the ability to transfer around and focus on those areas for their own development, which is highly desirable. It also gives them a way to also advance in different areas too, where they may lead a group of program mentors or a group of course instructors based upon uh, their own performance and how well they were accomplished at that. That's fantastic. I, I know um, I could definitely see that. Lisa says that she's been teaching and she does this instruct, assess, design for 17 years. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so the, the struggle is real on burnout. And I think, I think many of us hear you, right? When you start doing the same thing, you know, um, over and over again, when it feels like Groundhog Day, even and if the, the students are different, right? Right. Uh, and it, it, it always seems like that one thing that you, you like least about what you do 
becomes that thing you do the most of. <laughs> I know as a faculty member right. for 30 plus years too, uh, that even when I became dean, there was one course I still had to teach and I thought it for, taught it for 33 straight years, each term and mm -hmm. summer. And even though the course changed and we kept revising it, I could never get another faculty member to teach it or to share it with me. So I always had to teach it. So I understand and empathize with design, assess, evaluate, and keep that cycle going. It, it would have been helpful to have had more help. Yes. For sure. So I don't have any more questions pending in the queue. So I'm going to ask um, for you each to take a quick minute and give your your final thought, and then we'll turn everything back over to Megan to do our wrap up. All right, Chuck, you Freda, first. you want to start with? Your oh, well, I, I was just going to let Chuck start first, but I can start first. <laughs> I, I think if I had anything to say, I'm, um, I am definitely an advocate of competency-based education. And I think that one of the things that makes it so successful is faculty. And as many times as all institutions want to be student focused and student centered. And I think by having a very different and personalized faculty model with CBE allows for that to occur and for not just students to perform at their best, but to allow all the different faculty to perform at their best. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who attended today and the, and the great questions. Um, and if you have suggestions of what uh, things you do at your facility that maybe we could borrow as well. Yes, that's right. Feel free to share them with us. We'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll jump in here in the interest of time, but Callie, Verna, Chuck, I really appreciate your contributions. I think CBE really is helping with mentoring along the way certainly ensures that our students are going to persist and complete and that's going to help our institutions retain those students so thank you for your good work and thank you for the nod to CBIN. it was great to see so many familiar faces in this conversation today i just want to call out a few things if this is your first wcet experience we hope you enjoyed it and we have lots more programming coming up so our summit is june 4th through 5th in newport beach california and we're currently accepting proposals for our annual meeting, which is November 5 through 7 in Denver. The call for proposals is open through April 12th, and anybody is welcome to submit. We record all of our webinars, and we make them available on our webcast page, so you can go back and view any of these archives, including part one from January. And we will post the link to this recording as well as send it out next week. Two upcoming webinars for your calendar, April 18th, is personalizing experiences for three types of adult learners. May 16th, student ready, increasing retention for universities and career art outcomes for students, and that will feature Michael Horn. We want to thank our supporting members as well as our sponsorship. These great partners underwrite much of our events and programs here at WCET, and we couldn't do what we do without them. So. With that, if there's any final closing comments from our moderator, I'll go ahead and let her say something. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. And great, again, to see so many familiar faces and a, and a little nod to Lisa. Thank you for your comments and chatter throughout and your, tw and your tweets. Yes. I would just echo the same, say thank you all so much for being here with us today and for continuing the conversation about competency-based education in the greater whole of what we have to offer in higher education going forward. Um, and if it is your first time being engaged with WCET, come back. You can learn a whole lot just through um, attending these webinars and then also getting involved in our cooperative. Uh, we are a cooperative and it is one of the places where if you have questions, one of the best places to get answers is by getting involved in this community. So on anything uh, related to uh, teaching and learning with technology. So thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful event free, uh, whatever that <laughs> psycho glass thing free was, <laughs> uh, rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you guys.